Welcome, salutations, good evening. What did we look at in the previous lesson with greater detail than chapter and book? <laughs> yes. Yes, the 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 people of uh, Gibeon, uh, the uh, the uh, these uh, we talked about the uh, the compromise and the um, deal that Joshua and his uh, people made with uh, the people of uh, Gibeon. Um, uh, any anything else? Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, sister, brother, brother Jim. She conceded. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We, the, well, they they did definitely. Um, they definitely did. You used a level of deception that. Appealed to the, um, ba basically made them a low risk investment. <laughs> um, their, uh, they, their, um, their appearance, what they carried with them, and the way they talked, all led the people of God to believe that they were they weren't a threat or a ally they should be worried about taking. Uh, honestly, from the way they talked, they didn't even sound like they were from Canaan. That maybe they had come from another country somewhere else, um, which would have made it safe to invite them in. Unfortunately, they were just over sitting in the other holler, um, <laughs> and uh, that didn't work out real well for me. Anybody else? Uh, Sister John, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, they um uh there was um in in the compromise they allowed themselves um they allowed an opening for 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 enemies. And actually I think that's what we're going to we're going to see today. I almost think that's a pretty good segue. Uh Jared, if everything's okay, you you, you don't have to sit right on top of it unless you just want to. I know you got your Bible in a whole other place. Um uh the uh I think that's a good segue into what we're going to talk today, that this, this alliance that they made with Gibeon, it led to vulnerabilities. Every And, and, and like Sister John was saying from the previous lesson where we talked about how you, once you lose that ground, you can't regain it again. Once you've made that compromise, you're tied to that compromise. You're, you, part of your identity is attached to that compromise, even if you decided to go back on it. Now, the, the, it says very clearly in chapter 9 of Joshua that the princes of Israel swear by the Lord to the Gibeonites. So once they made that covenant before God to these people, there wasn't a thing they could do about it. That was just as binding as, uh, as, as, the, as the very salvation that some of us claim to have. Just as eternal. And... and in making that compromise, any time that we make that compromise, we are going to allow problems. And I think that's where we pick up in chapter 10. Now, it came to pass when Ad Adonidazadek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho, her king. Uh, so he had, uh, so he had had done to Ai and to her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. They, they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to um, uh, Hoham, king of Hebron, unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, unto uh, Jephiah, the king of Lachish, and to De Debir, the king of Eglon, saying, Come up with me and help me, 
that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made, uh, made a peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Now, word travels fast. Um, and I, I don't, uh, that's a very, very uh, common and colloquial saying, but uh, I, think, uh, I, I think it holds true, especially when we mess up. When we mess up, word travels fast. Anybody, any Joe Blow down the road here can make a mistake, make a mistake that we would deem egregiously sinful, and some people will take notice. Most people will just move right on past it because nothing is expected of the lost. Nothing is expected of the world. They go after their own desires. They follow their own desires. But when you mess up, everybody hears about it. And the fact that they had destroyed Jericho, they had destroyed Ai, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon, and this is the big one, had submitted themselves to the children of Israel and were now living among them. It says and they were with them. They were, they were, they were, um, that everybody hears about it. And uh, I, I don't think you could take this as an exact you know, corollary between life because they, they began to act out of fear. But the world will then seek opportunity to press their advantage. As Sister Donna said, as a little point that we made from chapter 9, is that once you give up ground, you, it is very, very difficult to regain it. Once you make that compromise, and people hear about it, and they will, whether it is your own family, whether it is other churches, and most likely other people in the world, they're going to hear about it. And once you make that choice, once you have made that decision, the opportunity for others to press the advantage will appear. And that's exactly what we see here. Adon, uh, Adonis this king, a king of Jerusalem, um, did not make his decision to attack Israel directly. No, that would be that would be too that would be too difficult. Assailing, and I think oftentimes the devil. The, I mean, the devil's smarter than we give him credit for. Far smarter. Uh, I mean, I think he is predictable in some of his tactics because he always targets the flesh because it's the one thing that he has great manipulation of. But as far as being as far as being dumb, I don't think that he's dumb. And Adonai Zedek, like the devil, was going to target where Israel was the weakest, where Israel would have the biggest, um, uh, the lowest defenses, if you will, and that was this city of Gibeon. So, and, and this is another thing, uh, when, when it comes to being attacked by the devil, a lot of times it's not just a singular point of pressure. You're not all of a sudden going to just have one thing pop up in your life. It's going to be multiple things. It's going to stress the stress. Anytime anything's going on spiritually, whether against you, th that you're doing good for the Lord, or that you're doing poorly for the Lord, the stress from work is going to kick up. Everything in your house is going to break that week. Everything. Um, the, uh, the 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 kids are going to come down with some great illness. Uh, you're gonna have you're gonna you're uh, you're gonna start experiencing uh, you you know you're, you're gonna have auto trouble, uh, and then you're also going to have whatever this great temptation is slide right in there too. And Adonis a day did the very same thing. He's like, I, I really can't fight this thing by myself. So what does he do? He goes against five of his buddies, and he says, Hey, let's attack Gibeon because that is the weak point. We know for sure. Israel has made a pact with Gibeon. Gibeon is, is their weak point. Joshua and his bunch are set up in Gilgal. There's no assailing that camp. You're not gonna come out, you're not gonna come out and face them head on. And the devil's not gonna come out and face you head on. There's not there's never uh, the, the devil's not fighting with revolutionary war tactics. He's not gonna line up in a field and you're gonna stand on either side and he's gonna fire a volley at you and you're gonna return a volley and then you're all gonna sit there and reload. No, he's gonna come at you with subtility. He's going he's he's going to use the uh, the the the, uh, the Navy SEAL uh, uh, the SEAL Team Six type tactics. They're gonna go in, he's gonna come in, he's going to do his damage, and he's gonna leave before you even know that he's been there. And that was the plan here. So he, he, he gathers this, this army of, of, of five cities. There, uh, 
Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, and they and all their hosts and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. See, this is the problem with making compromise. It, that compromise is your point of ingress. What do we talk about the phalanx? If one man lets his shield down, the entire phalanx is compromised. This is, that is the weak point. That is the place where you apply the greatest pressure. And Israel, who would have had the opportunity to approach each of these five cities as they had done Ai and they had done Jericho and take them individually, are now faced with a situation where we have to take on an army that is five times, uh, five, four times greater than we would have if we had just been able to take each of these cities in turn. Why? Because they made a decision to compromise with Gibeon. They could have rolled over that hill onto Gibeon, taken Gibeon, and... and and moved right along. Maybe Jerusalem would have been next. Maybe maybe Jarmuth would have been next. Whichever one of these cities they come up that they came across next, that would have been their next target. But they compromised. They they let they let their guard down, and now they have a greater force pressing right against them. And that is how the devil works. He is going to take this point of ingress. He's going to take whatever it is in your life that you're that you're letting your guard down on, and we all do it because we're all fleshly, and that is where the pressure is going to be applied. And in the meantime, he's going to use all these other stressors in our, fle in our fleshly life to weaken us. He's going to he's going he's going to apply that work stress. He's going to apply that family stress. He's going to apply uh, maybe even some spiritual stress. You know, you I don't believe that people can be that saved people can be possessed, but we can be oppressed. The devil can assault you directly if he desires. He's never going to take you, but all he needs is to apply enough pressure so that you bend and then break. That's all he needs. Let's continue. Um, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the, uh, all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. Therefore shall not a, ma a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore went up from them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them all the way that goeth up to, he to Beth Haran, and smote them and Ezekah, and unto uh, Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel, and were going down uh, to Beth Haran, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto uh, Ezekah, uh, and they died, and and they which were, and they were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Now the difference between the way that we often deal with these pressurized situation and the way that Joshua was blessed to have dealt with this situation is they had the Lord with him. And oftentimes that's not where we turn. When work stress comes down on us, what do we do? We work harder. When when family stress comes at us, we Try to spend more time with the family. When spiritual stress gets get, gets gets on top of us, a lot of times this is the opposite of what you're supposed to do. We turn away from spiritual things because it's easier to 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 avoid the situation than to actually face it head on. Uh, and and we invest more of our time in these things than than turning to the one person that can actually do something. Now you look at this battle where they approach the five kings. Very little of the of Israel fighting is noted here. It said that the Lord discomforted them, and I want to point this out. Let me turn my page, and they're stuck together. Um, uh, it said, verse ten it said, the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter. Now I'm not no great English major, but it says that the Lord discomforted them, comma, and slew them. Now. The noun that the slew, the verb slew is referencing is still the Lord. So Israel didn't do a lot of fighting here. The Lord, the Lord, and I think it probably is something very similar to what happened with the Midianites, if you remember the story of Gideon. 
um, and the Midianites where they basically just turned on each other. They were so confused by what was going on, they turned on each other and started slaying one another. Now that could have happened. It also could have been angels. We know that uh, that the Lord will attribute a host of his angels to his people if he so desires. You can look in, 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 in Kings and look at Elisha, and he, he tells his, he wants Elisha's servant to be able to see all the angels around him, and the, whole, the mountains and hills and hollers were full of them. So, uh, you know, whatever the situation was, the Lord fought most of the battle here for them. And then when they, they started chasing them, so the children of Israel, they, they, they apply more pressure. They, and, 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 and they start chasing them. And then the Lord starts raining literal hailstones, big old chunks. It says, it, says, uh, it says great stones. So these weren't, these weren't your little pebble-sized hailstones that you get right now. These, weren't, these aren't going to put a, a pot mark in the hood of your car. No, these were rocks raining down from heaven. Uh, and arti literally artillery fire from, from above. Uh, and it rains down on them. And, and what they, what Israel slew versus what God slew was a minuscule amount. Now, when we have these troubles in our life, when we feel that pressure from the devil, when we feel that that point of ingress being pressed, and like I said, a lot of time it's going to be out. Your first symptom of this is going to be outside stress pressing on you, and, and, and then you're going to know, hey, what's, what's something's going on. So, and now I'm not saying that life's going to be perfect. And it's like, well, if you live a certain way, you're just going to have a stress-free life. Well, that's, that's, that's inaccurate as well. I'm just saying these are these are the ways the Lord, the devil, oftentimes will pressure us. Now, we need to turn to God. God again, and I said this at the beginning of the class, and I think I think the 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 idea still holds holds a lot of merit in this that we don't have to fight our battles. We're 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 conditioned and told to pick up our sword and charge in the battlefield. And that's exactly what you should, should be doing. There were Israeli soldiers on this battlefield. Who was doing the chasing if not the people of Israel? It also says that the people of Israel got some shots too because it didn't say that they didn't slay anybody. It just said God slew more than they did. So it's not that you're not supposed to be out there. It's that you're not the only one that has to do the swinging. And we rely on ourselves so much, so often to do to do this thing. You know what? You didn't rely on yourself. For, you didn't. Uh, those of you that are saved, they're truly saved. You didn't rely on yourself for your own salvation. You didn't lie. Re, you, and, and and I don't understand why we feel like we have to rely on ourselves for our daily fights. But it's so much easier. And and and, and I guess maybe we get far enough away from our salvation that we forget. But it's so much easier for us to lose faith in what God has the power to do and to effect. Well, he saved my soul, but I need to do this. He saved my soul, but... And I think some of it honestly comes down to, you know, and we are taught to be separate in the Bible, and that's something that we can do. But I think the mentality of we have to do something overrides the ability to just let God take care of it. He doesn't need... Never has He needed our help. Again, with your salvation, your, your, the, your involvement was that you were present. That 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 is it. That is that is your involvement. And I I don't understand where we get off thinking that we that we that when it comes to fighting the devil that I have to fight an ar archangel by myself with all the weaknesses that I as a human being possess and all the advantages that him as an angel that he possesses. Why do we think we have to take that fight? The de the God's already won that fight. He smacked the devil right out of heaven and ha and a third of his angels with him. He's already won that, and he'll win it again, and he'll win it again. <laughs> That's the thing. He'll he he's he's won that fight. He won it whenever he uh, whenever he was on uh, at forty days uh, after he had a uh, uh, fasting. He won that fight. He wanted he defeated death, hell, the grave, and the devil on Calvary and on his uh, and his resurrection. He de he defeated him there. He'll defeat him again. At the last battle, when he comes down, he steps out and he crushes everybody, and he'll defeat him again when he comes back a thousand years later. God's not going to lose a fight with the devil, so why are you trying to fight it? We need to be present on the battlefield, but we need to be trusting in the one who has the actual spiritual power. You look, and, and I think a good example of this, if you look in Acts, where it talks about the, the seven sons of Sceva, where they tried to cast out a devil. By the says, and they said, Paul I know, and I forget who, it was a 
and Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> and then that devil goes on to beat the tar out of them and strip them naked and run them out of the house. That is our personal effectiveness against devils. We, we don't have any. And it's like, well, uh, you know, the, the devil's not, you know, the, the, whatever's in your life, that's not the devil attack. Well, who is it? He is the great accuser. He is the poser. Satan actually means opposer in Hebrew. That's exactly what he does. And it may, well, he, it may not be him in person, but he is the one pressing these advantages. He doesn't like us. He doesn't like you. <laughs> he loathes you. He loathes himself. Let's continue um, before we get too too far behind. And jo then uh, then spake uh, Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said, In the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down uh, about a whole day, and there was no day like it uh, before, before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, Joshua needed more time. See, the battle was going good, and they were running out of daylight. And Joshua said, I know somebody who can take care of this problem. And he stood up and he said, the sun's going to stand here and the moon's going to stand over there. And I, I'm probably it was twilight. Have you ever been ever been of an evening, a summer evening, and look and the sun's over here and you actually see a trace of the moon out that way? He said, I need I need everything to stay right the way it is, right now. I need I need this to halt. And we're going to go on. And it stayed that way for 24 hours, said, uh, about the space of a whole day. 24-hour period of sunlight where they kept pressing the advantage. See, when we when we when we have victory in the Lord, we got to press the advantage. And I and I know a couple of weeks ago we talked about rest, and rest is important. But when when the enemy's on the run, this isn't the time to stop. This isn't the time to lay down. And say, oh, they're far enough out. We'll worry about them another day. No, press your advantage. And 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 it says it says and and, uh, and there was no day like it before or after that the Lord hearkened unto a voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So there's never been a day like this again. According to the Bible, that the that the Lord hearkened to a man. You know, um, they said that God set up the sun and the stars and the moon. They're, they're not astrological signs; they are foretelling the times. There, there. Uh, if if anybody wants to know what other worlds and all this stuff in space is for, it's a gigantic clock that God set up for us to know when things are taking place, what time things are taking place. And uh, and and I think uh, uh, you can look at it, you look at uh, look at the three wise men that came to, to visit Jesus. What were they looking at? They weren't looking at they weren't looking at their clocks. They they weren't even necessarily looking at the scriptures. Where were they looking? They were looking at the at the timepiece that God gave them. They looked for the stars. Um the uh, uh, and God held that. God stopped the stopwatch and says, "We're in overtime. I'm hitting the button." We're going to take care of this, and then it says, "Then the Lord fought for them." That the Lord pressed the advantage. Not only did, did did see, I think I think the Lord was encouraged by Joshua's actions. He's like, "Not the Lord has slew them. We've slew them. We're pressing them, but there's just not enough time left to finish this job." So I'm asking you, Lord, just give us a little bit more time. And the Lord said, "We're gonna we're gonna halt time, and we're just gonna do this thing, and, and I'm gonna fight with you." Now, now think about. We don't often think about God having reactions like like we do, and and I think He's higher. He's a higher consciousness. He's a He's a spirit being. He's way beyond. But He's encouraged by our actions. Why do we pray? Not because He needs to know what our He knows everything we need before we ask Him. Why? Because our prayers are a sweet smelling savor to Him. He does it because we do it because He enjoys it. He likes it. And this, I think, I think the Lord was just thrilled to be with Joshua. I think the Lord, the Lord was like, my people, for the first time in many, many years, and all you have to do is flip through the first, the Pentateuch and the early part of the book of Joshua, and there wasn't a lot of God's people pulling in the same direction that God was pulling. There, there were moments. But I think for, for one of the first times in history, God's like, 
not only are my people doing what do what I want them to do, but they're asking me to pull along with them, to help them, to do more with them. And you know what? I'm going not only am I gonna do what they am I gonna grant what they ask, they're gonna get a bonus. I'm gonna fight with them. And he and he, and he does here too. Um and Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. But these five kings fled themselves in a cave at Mechida. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found in a cave at Mechida. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave, and set men by it, for to keep them. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. Now, what can we can we glean from this? Well, first of all, when we finally turn whatever it is in our life that has is attacking us, when we finally turn their backs, we need to keep pressing the advantage. More than that, too, is when we finally catch up to them, and they did catch up to these five kings. This was an opportunity to stop. Joshua said, just lock them away. Set a watch on them. And keep pressing your advantage. You're winning right now. Don't stop now. And so when we overcome some of this stuff, we don't need to stop and just dwell on it. We don't need to stop and, 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 and stamp it out. And, and, and we do need to be careful. And I think they were being careful here. What the, the, These five kings, they wanted to make sure they couldn't escape, so they put big stones in front of the door. And, and they set a watch on it. We have to watch these things in our life. We have to pay attention to them. But when we're fighting in the battle, we got to press the advantage. It's not time to stop and deal with our personal issues. We're, we're having victory with the Lord. This isn't time to, to wallow in what has attacked us. It's time to press. Um, and they did so and brought... Uh, I think I have pushed on past where I was at. Uh, and it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they were consumed. The rest which remained of them entered into fin cities, and all the people returned into the camp at uh, Me Mechida in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, Open the mouth of the cave, and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so, and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought those kings unto Joshua. And Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains and the men of war which went with him, Come near and put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus saith the Lord, uh, the Lord to, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies whom against ye fight. Now what do we do? Now I said we have, we can't dwell on them, we can't wallow in them, and we're pressing the advantage. We have to do it. But the battle is over. They have fought the battle. They have won the battle. They have utterly destroyed their enemies. And now again, I think we can bring up the, it's time to rest. They return to the camp. And now we're going to we're gonna address the problems that were plaguing us. And they roll these stones away and they bring these five kings out. And I'm sure they toss them on the ground there before Joshua and said, Joshua, Joshua says, bring, bring, bring the leaders over here. Put your foot on all their necks. He says, the way that you're standing right now, the way that you have these men down and prostrate and trod underneath you, the Lord's going to do that to all of your enemies. And he can. He can do that for every problem in your life. He can put your foot with his power. He can put your foot on their neck. Whatever that you're dealing with. But you, you have to be willing to fight. You have to be willing to go to war with him. You have to, you, you, it, it, you have to be present. And I think so, so often times we just turn the other direction and or, or we're trying to fight one king at the time or, 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 we're, or, we're, or, we're, or, we're, or we're just oblivious to it. We, we submit. We yield. To the, when in a day, well, I mean, probably 18 hours if you... <laughs> or, well, no, probably 36 hours if you, if you read this story correctly. Um, but... In a short amount of time, these things can all be laid at our feet. And and then, whose is the glory? Joshua doesn't say, what jo the men of Israel did this. He said, no, this, the Lord's going to do this to all your enemies. The Lord. This this is this is His power. The, 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 the victory that you have gained is all from Him. Um, um, and afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees and... And they were hanging upon the trees until evening. And it came to pass at the time 
of the of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them off the trees and cast them in the cave wherein they had been hid, and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain of this very day. Now this ritual of the hanging and everything, as I was trying to think about where where is our personal application? I think this ultimately comes down to first of all praise. Praise to God. When, we, when, when Brother Larry is in service, he says, does any, does any of the men have anything else to say? This is your opportunity to tell everybody about the victory that you have gained. Why did they hang them on the trees? As a warning to anybody else what, we're gonna, what was going to happen to them and also show God has put these people down. This is the work that he's wrought unto them. It was an example. It was, it was a display of... Of, of their power, of, of, their, uh, of their victory over them. And that's our opportunity to do so. And also, I, I think sometimes when we, we don't want to address that stuff because it's also a dis- that was a display of the weakness of Israel too. They had made that covenant with Gibeon, and that was the result of it. But still, despite their weakness, God gave them the victory over it. And so sometimes I don't think we want to do that kind of stuff because we don't want to show ourselves... As having made it, made a boo boo, made made a mistake, because the evidence of it is hanging there before everybody. Um, but uh, and then they took them out and they and they threw them in the cave and they said they said they set stones at the door. They threw them back in the cave where they came from. They set stones at the door. Um, whatever the sin is or whatever the thing is that is pestering us, uh, remember that. It is buried deep for the saved person. It is buried deep beneath the blood of Christ. There's a, there was a stone at the door. There was a rock, if you will. Nobody's ever going to think about them people again. Nobody's ever going to be thinking about, wondering whatever happened to those kings again because they've been buried. They've been put far away. They're, they're under. And it, all, all, is forgi- uh, all, all has been forgiven. I, I think... I think a lot of times we will take these, we, we will leave the kings hanging. We will leave these things in our life to present and we'll revisit it. And we'll and we'll wallow in it. And we'll and we'll take it. And sometimes we'll fall to it again. Over and over and over. Uh, we have to put these things away and put them out of our mind forever. Just seal them up. Be gone. Be done with them. Bury them. Um and Joshua took, uh, and that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof, and uh, he utterly destroyed them and all the souls that uh, that were there, and he let none remain. As he he did, uh, and he did to the king of Makeda as he did to the king of Jericho. And Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with him to Libna, and fought against Libna. Now, the the rest of the chapter goes through, and it, it is it is Libna, and then Lachish. And then Horam, um, uh, no, and and then Eglon, uh, as he goes and he defeats these cities. The rest of the chapter talks about the cities of these kings where he just utterly wipes them out. And I don't, it's almost a a repeat every single time. I don't see the point of, of, of reading through all of that um, over and over. Um, but they press the advantage. And they wipe it out. They they completely remove all these people. And in verse forty, so Joshua smote all the country of the hills and all the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. And he left nothing remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed, as the Lord God of Israel commanded. Again, we go back to where we very start, where we started at the very beginning of this thing, following God's plan. Stay on the plan. Do the plan. Complete the plan. Work the plan. Um. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings in their land did Joshua take at one time, because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned in all Israel with him unto the camp in Gilgal. Now they go back and they rest. They press the advantage. They have the sap. Basically, if you really know what what, you want to know what they have conquered, they've got the land of Judah. They've got they have reclaimed what will be uh in the future the southern kingdom, if you want to look at like the chronicles and the later kings, 
uh, it will be where David will set up his throne. It will be where Solomon reigns from. Uh, Jerusalem was mentioned. Now, Jerusalem wasn't always the city of God's people. Uh, David will make it that later on. Uh, but uh, for now, they have they have reclaimed they've reclaimed what would be, I think, if you look at the scriptures, one of the crowning jewels of the region. They have gotten they have they have gained a um, a very important uh, an important thing. And why? Because they pressed they pressed. And did they have some fall downs? Yes, I think you can read from when did it when did the campaign actually start? Chapter six, chapter five, chapter six. To chapter ten, and there were some missteps. Let's review. Is it well? You know, I don't want to review. I know them. Do you know them? What were the missteps they made on this for on this southern campaign? They tried to take AI in their own strength. While what else was going on? Aiken sin in the camp. What else? Other missteps. With who? With 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 the people of Gibeon. I think I think this southern campaign is a really good example of Christian life because it doesn't mean everything that Israel fell down on is stuff that we fall down on every single day. Did that make them any less victorious? We're human people, and that's not an excuse, but that's just a reality check. You're not going to live perfectly. You can try, and I think we should try. But you're not going to do it. If I believe that that was possible, I might as well just go up and sign with uh, sign up with the, uh, the 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 holiness people, uh, because eventually I may che- achieve sinless perfection. I might just you know pop on out of here. But that's not reality. That's not the, that's not the real world we live in. We're going to fall down, but that does not make us any less able to have a victorious life, to have a victorious time, to take the battles that we were always meant to take. Just because you're falling down right now does not mean you can't stand up. Just because there's sin in the camp does not mean that you can't take care of that and go beat that one little thing that's been knocking you around. Just because you've compromised on one thing does not mean that whenever that compromise becomes an issue that you just need to fall down and fall prostrate before five other things that are going on in your life. No, it's time to press the advantage. With who? Not of your own power. You can take the, and the word of God is powerful. In fact, it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even in the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. This is a very powerful book, but you can't wield it by yourself. You don't have enough strength in your arm to fight the own battles. The only way you're going to do it is if you have God on your side. And we're not going to have him on our side if we allow these little things, these things along our campaign of life, if you will, to slow us up. We're not going to have his power and ability if we're not pressing with his plan. We're not going with the thing that he wants us to do. Important things to think about. Are there any questions or comments about chapter 10 or any of the this first uh, big chunk of Joshua here? I don't know if we're going to let it off here, but uh, if we're going to move on to something else, but this seemed like a, a really good capstone to this earlier part of the book. So I, I I do want to review it in its entirety if you have any questions or comments about the entirety there. Yes? Praise the Lord for it. Oh, yeah. Well, and, 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 and as I say this, and it, it, it hopefully doesn't sound like I'm berating, because I'm right there in the middle of it with you. You know, I, I'm I'm no great thing. I fall down every single day, and most time I fall down and I split my noggin on the way down. I'm sorry. Yep, we have we we ha- we have to press on, and, and and first step is finding God's plan. That was the first step for Israel: is get, finding the plan, getting with the plan, and working that plan. We, we, I think, so much of our life is spent with our hands in our pockets. I just don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here. We, we got we, we. You're a vessel. You're a warrior. You're not meant to sit around, run drills or something. If you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, but we have we have we have to be in it. Anybody else? 
All right. Um, that is going to wind us up for today. And like I said, I don't know. We may we may press up a little bit further in Joshua. I'm, this may be it for it. But today felt like a capstone. This is this is this was a this was the end of that southern campaign for Joshua. And I think this is a this is a big moment for Israel. This was I, I think this is where Joshua went from warrior Joshua to leader Joshua to Joshua that trusted God to to fight his battles. If there's no other anything else, you are dismissed. Have a fantastic week. Thank you.